Alaska. It's the last frontier. Bordering both the Pacific and Arctic Ocean, Alaska has 40,000 miles of shoreline. It's the largest territory owned by the United States and one of the fishing and freight capitals of the world. If there's one word to describe Alaska, it's infinite. Whatever records other US states hold, Alaska will probably beat them. It's just that massive. Welcome to an endless paradise of rivers, glaciers, active volcanoes, beaches, islands, and more animals than any of us can count. If you like being outside and living life on the edge, this is the perfect place for you. Unless you're not okay with 30 degrees below Fahrenheit, but we'll save that experience for another trip. For now, let's enjoy the end of summer on a 10-day journey from Anchorage down to the Kenai Peninsula. Whale watching, hiking, fishing, glaciers, breweries, and mingling with the locals are all on the agenda. Tag along with my wife and I as we take on Alaska. I'm Brady Sky. I film, I travel, I fly. And I'm ready to share the experience with you. Cheers, man. If you're not boarding a cruise ship, there's a good chance you'll get your first glimpse of Alaska flying into its biggest city. Once covered by a massive glacier, the city of Anchorage is located in the south central part of the state on the Cook Inlet. It's a relatively flat area surrounded by mountains with a tall glass of history the city is rightfully proud of. English explorer Captain James Cook first explored the area in 1778, but native tribes had already been enduring the cold winters there for thousands of years. You'll find historic facts scattered throughout the city and pretty much everything else at the Anchorage Museum. From the primitive ways of the native tribes to Alaska's heavy involvement in World War II, rain ponchos made of animal intestines, and the first known kayaks and toboggans are among hundreds of other inventions found here. Some of the Inuit people are still living traditionally in small remote villages today. There's about 300,000 residents here in Anchorage, but it's home to much more than humans. At the moment, its residents also include bears, wolves, lynx, foxes, and at least a thousand moose. The phrase, I'll be there when she moves, is not uncommon when someone's late for work. On day one, we had our first taste of Alaskan fish and crab at Glacier Brew House, one of the most popular breweries in Anchorage. That's good. After satisfying our crave for Alaskan fresh seafood, we decided to hit the coastal trail. The Coastal Trail is an 11-mile trail on the coast of Anchorage, offering a quick escape from the city life right into the Alaskan wilderness. We saw quite a few locals hop on different sections of the trail to take their dog for a walk, going for a jog, or riding bikes. The trail features breathtaking views of the Cook Inlet, ancient forest growth, airplanes landing and departing above, artistic parks, and if you get lucky, you might see a moose. This was my first glimpse of a moose taking a midday nap that just wouldn't get up for a picture. Kristen found some wild salmon berries right away and I learned just how many there are scattered around Alaska. Among 1,500 species of wildflowers, fresh blueberries, raspberries, and salmon berries can be found just about anywhere this time of year. Talk to some locals around Anchorage, and you'll likely find that most of the locals are here because they love it. And I was lucky enough to sit down with Mark, who's been here for 50 years. What do you think people think of when they think of Alaska who have never been here? Most of them think first of the cold, and then they think of things like igloos, and the natives live in igloos. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, there's really two different ways to see Alaska. One is to get on a cruise ship that goes out of maybe Seattle or Vancouver. The other way to see Alaska is to come up 
further on a boat or a plane to get into Anchorage. Another hour or two, you're in Seward or Homer, which are two of the more beautiful towns. What do you think, as someone who's been here for 50 years, are some of the things you should definitely experience if you're here? Some of the most interesting things are of course the mountains and the wildlife. Camping and fishing are two of my favorite things. Would you say most people who live here love the outdoors? Isn't that one of the reasons that you're here? Yeah, and it might be mountain biking or kayaking or just hiking. What are some of the things that you have to deal with living in Alaska? You know, I feel sheltered up here in a lot of ways from things that happen in the lower 48. We have our share of of earthquake now and then and, and forest fires some years can get pretty out of hand. The economy, it's expensive to live in Alaska, but there are people that move out to the bush and build a cabin and have a float plane come in every couple weeks, bring them some supplies they need. Are there any conflicts going on around Anchorage that some people are upset about? Or? Oh, there, there's constant battles, for example, among the fishing groups. There's the commercial fishermen, the subsistence fishermen, and the sport fishermen. And what percentage each group gets a year has always been controversial. And in the last five or 10 years, the stocks of fish have gone significantly down. And that's how they feed their family. It's how they feed their dog teams. Why do you think all of this is happening? Well, obviously there's a climate change. In places like Alaska, it's more significant than it is in other places in the country and the world because we're so far north. But it's affecting the wildlife, such as the polar bears. In Cook Inlet, they have beluga whales, but they're not I'm not around that much anymore. There used to be a thousand. I think we're down to 300 in, in Cook Inlet. A lot of the cliffs along the ocean up north have, have washed away and things like animal bones and native graveyards are starting to come out of the side of the hills. Wow. Mammoths, woolly mammoth bones. <laughs> well, let's say someone like me wanted to help with this whole climate change thing. What is it that I can do to help? You know, a lot of it is is big scale. It's, it's automotive exhaust, it's coal generating power plants. A lot of it comes from China and from Russia and they've done testing in the fields of isotopes and things like that to find out exactly where a lot of this comes from. Plus forest fires in Russia are really bad this year. We've had smoke in the air in Anchorage from forest fires in Russia. Having been here for most of his life, Mark has also had a chance to fly small airplanes. After all, Alaska is one of the general aviation capitals of the world. Right out of high school, I got my pilot license and... Uh, Would you say that's one of the best ways to see Alaska? It is. It is, definitely. I've gone a lot of places I could never get to because there's no roads to them. But uh, there's a hazard to being a private pilot or commercial pilot for that matter in Alaska. The weather is nasty, the lack of navigational aids, the lack of weather reporting, uh, things like that. And you can get yourself in trouble. I've scared myself a few times over the years. <laughs> Being the pilot and aviation enthusiast that I am, of course I had to spend the next morning watching the seaplanes depart from Lake Hood. Back in the 1970s, the state began dredging out a canal and created takeoff and taxi lanes here. Today, Lake Hood is host to nearly 200 daily operations and has become the largest and busiest seaplane base in the world. Some pilots are here to fly to their cabin off the grid. Others are on flight scene tours. I've enjoyed my short time in Anchorage, eating and drinking my way around a few classic dive bars and modern trends, but let's get out of town like one of those seaplanes. They say Alaska's only 30 minutes from Anchorage. Let's go find out why and head south on the Seward Scenic Byway. The motto of the state of Alaska is north to the future, meaning the land of promise. And I can vouch that Alaska's scenery promises to wow you around every turn. Beluga Point is right off the highway and it's a tough place to drive by without stopping. There's 180 degree views here of Turnigan Arm, which produces waves from a bore tide. And at the right times, surfers will come from all over to try to ride it. Sometimes at Beluga Point, you'll find, well, you guessed it, beluga whales. We found a mother and her calf close to shore. 
we continued our journey south on the Seward Highway and stopped at the end of Turnigan Arm near Portage Lake, where we took our first hike on what's called Byron Glacier Trail. This trail passes through an alder and cottonwood forest leading to bouldering rocks and an expansive, ever-changing snowfield where you really don't want to walk on thin ice. There was families there and dogs, and as we made our way past the communal area, we ran into a local named Maya, who frequented this trail, and she said, although it may be heavily trafficked, it's just so undeniably beautiful. She was foraging for berries and insisted that we have a few. The berry season in Alaska lasts anywhere from late August to late September, she said. <laughs> salmon berry, and I look like you're eating like a berry of roe. Yeah, salmon kinda, row. for sure. As I stood there in that moment, I took a mental note of this place and thought, wow, this is definitely one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. Making my way back, I had that glacier out in the distance stuck in my head. I just was thinking, how long will this place be here? I wanted to know more. I wanted to know more about glaciers, and I looked forward to learning more at the next one. <gasps> Our next stop, Bear Creek Lodge. Owners Derek and Janine recently purchased the lodge and have revamped its offerings. With cabin rentals on a scenic property, featuring a private pond, creek, fire pit, and let's not forget, Romeo and Juliet, the ducks. They also have one of the most popular restaurants in the area, right on site. Where is this lodge located? In a little place called Hope. If there is one thing that took me most by surprise this entire trip, it's probably Hope, Alaska. Situated right on the other side of Turnigan Arm lies a quiet, historic trip back in time. With a population of only a couple hundred, this place is what one might hope for when you think of Alaska. Log cabins, an old general store, a friendly cafe by the water, none of which have changed much since the last gold rush. And the gold we struck was being there on the weekend for the live music. Bundle next to Resurrection Creek. Locals within reach gather right here at the Sea View for a pint and some dancing. This moment was actually quite shocking in the best way. More and more people started showing up, but everyone showed up with a smile. It became very clear this was a place of no judgment allowed. Everyone was accepted here. Okay, everybody get a beer. And, and that was our night at Hope, Alaska, where we ended up going to multiple different places with live music. We kept asking around, is this a special occasion? And everyone said, no. It's just the weekend. couldn't have access to a 4x4 truck in Alaska and not explore a dirt road. The roads less traveled are often the best, so the next morning I woke up early and took a drive. I kept looking at the map thinking, should I turn around? But I kept going. I had to see where this public road ended. For years, I've imagined a place with green hills, snowy mountains, waterfalls, and wildflowers, and kept thinking it had to be somewhere in Austria or Switzerland. I was wrong. 
it was right here in Alaska too. So there I found myself surrounded by beauty I had only dreamt of. I can only imagine what it would be like to be the first person in this box canyon. The first explorer to ever see it. And this is just one small piece of the last frontier. You could spend your whole life flying around Alaska and probably still not see it all. Almost 50% of Alaska is covered in what's known as boreal forest. White spruce, quaking aspen, paper birch, and balsam poplar can all be found here. They are the product of extreme climatic factors with temperatures varying as much as 160 degrees Fahrenheit from summer to winter. Short growing periods cause tight growth rings, making the wood prized for strength and delicate beauty. As we made our way through plants shimmering with pockets of light, we discovered something else in this particular part of the woods. A place designed specifically to enjoy them. It was a yurt village, fit for cute little furry creatures from a 1970s sci-fi. But in this case, us humans will be enjoying it for the next few nights. Equipped with a communal area and plenty of fire pits, the Naughty Otter Inn is just a short drive from Seward, and it's a great place to stay if you're looking to make the most of Alaskan forests. Founded in 1903 as the ocean terminus of what is now the Alaska Railroad, Seward prides itself not only on its natural beauty, but as Alaska's only deep water, ice-free port with rail, highway, and air transportation to Alaska's interior and major urban population centers. It's a progressive community that enjoys a beautiful and scenic natural Alaskan environment with numerous attractions. The town offers day cruises, kayaking, fishing, abundant marine activities and wildlife, unparalleled recreation, and is still the terminus for the Alaska Railroad. This is where we'll get out on the water for some whale watching, visit the Sea Life Center, and check out Exit Glacier. But before we do any of that, we've got to try a bucket of butt. Thorn Showcase Lounge has some of the best flash fried halibut chunks in all of Alaska. They're a melt in your mouth, unique experience you'll be craving for a while. For many people, seeing Exit Glacier up close is the highlight of their visit in Seward. As the ice melts, reaching the glacier has become more and more difficult. A receding glacier uncovers terrain that may be steep, unstable, and hard to cross. The creek often changes course and erodes banks and destroys trails. Even when you get close, it's not always safe. Ice caves and overhangs along the glacier's edge can collapse without warning. So how far has this glacier retreated? Let's just say we're talking in miles. So that's Exit Glacier now, but it used to be all the way down there. Since the origin of its documentation in the early 1800s, it's traveled miles back up toward the Harding Ice Field. As we hiked to the Exit Glacier lookout, we ended up venturing quite a bit further on our own. There was only a small amount of scrambling and exposure. We were then alone and able to get up close and personal with this glacier that felt both intimidating and alive. Although it may appear static, signs of movement are all around. Delicate snowflakes compact into dense glacial ice and are set in motion by gravity. 
The resulting river of ice is powerful enough to carve bedrock and erode mountains. Sediment streaks form when pockets of dirt layered in the ice stretch as the ice flows, showing the direction the glacier is moving. Surface water drains into cracks, carving pipelines, and ice chunks break off and fall all the time, from pea size to bigger than a dump truck. This living laboratory was a life-changing experience to witness this close. The effects of a changing climate were more clear than ever to me. A conflict hard to imagine being presented so simply right in front of my eyes. Despite the acceleration of climate change, experiencing this glacier felt larger than life and miraculous and was surprisingly convenient to get to on foot. Next stop, the Sea Life Center. Alaska's only permanent marine mammal rehabilitation facility just happens to be located right here in Seward on the shores of Resurrection Bay. It combines a public aquarium with marine research, education, and wildlife response. Here we learned about how scientists are working to conserve seabird populations, the life of a salmon, and met Forrest and Kuliak, the stellar sea lions. Kuliak is a four-year-old male who weighs 400 pounds, and Forrest is a seven-year-old male who weighs 870 pounds. Here they are putting two and two together to make about 1,200 pounds. Stopping by the Sea Life Center contributes to sea life conservation and also guarantees you're going to see some animals you might not find in the wild, which is exactly our next mission. It's really nice and everything. But not before some tacos at Lon Chicharron Taqueria and some pinto beans with cilantro lime rice. You'll find many options for boat tours in Seward, from big boats to small boats. And we ended up with Northern Latitude Adventures on a private charter with Captain Nick. He's been in Seward since 2007. And when he's not in Seward, there's a good chance you'll find him in Hawaii. Living life between Alaska and Hawaii doesn't sound so bad. He said as far as the weather here goes, there's some years better than others, and they've dealt with wildfires. They do depend on that colder climate to keep things flowing. He said we picked a great day to do this tour because the conditions were nice and calm, which make for a perfect time to look for wildlife. And right away, we stumbled upon a pair of sea otters. Nick said they're in the typical otter formation, laying on their backs with their feet and paws out of the water. Unlike most other marine animals, otters lack a blubber layer. Instead, they depend on their dense, water-resistant fur to provide insulation. Their fur contains between 600,000 to a million hair follicles per square inch. So to keep warm, they spend a large portion of their days grooming and conditioning their fur. Oh my gosh, an otter just popped up right there. <laughs> he was under the water. There's another otter right there. Yeah. Yeah, I think he went to go get food. Cruising along Resurrection Bay, you're guaranteed to see a ton of different kinds of seabirds and potentially eagles, otters, sea lions, mountain goats, and one of the most rugged, majestic coastlines with rock formations that can't even be imagined. Here we are approaching some puffins. So the puffins will actually only come in here during the summer to lay eggs and breed, and then they'll go out to the middle of the ocean, just bob around for the rest of the year. Like so maybe three or four months here, and the rest of the time just hanging out in the middle of the ocean, fishing, They'll actually change color. So we're going to come up to a circus of puffins right up here on our left. Circus of puffins? Yeah. Is that they're actually called? It's one of the, one of the terms for them. But yeah. Wow. But I, and I think it's because they look like little clowns. Yeah. They're all colored up. This being a half day tour, our expectations were not high to see a whale this time of year. But we were still hopeful. Will we find a humpback whale? I haven't seen him come up again yet. Whoa. Oh my gosh. Whoa. <laughs> that was crazy. All these animals, all these humpbacks are looking for food and they get as fat as they can. 
all summer long before they have to travel to Hawaii. Uh, because when they get down to Hawaii, there's no food for them. There's a lot of fish, not a lot of schooling fish, and what these whales like to eat are very small fish that swim together in big groups. Yeah. <laughs> wow, so this one could actually be in a pretty deep dive. Yeah, it's been, it's been about five minutes now. I mean, yeah. they could pop up anywhere at this point. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah that, and it's that was cool though. Tough to say. If you look at the water, it kind of shallowed up behind us. So that might be why the whale kind of took off out from the island. It could turn right back in, or it might be out. Oh, just here's something. Here goes the tail. Oh, yeah. Lovely shot. Nice eye. Yeah. I was yeah. <laughs> Are there bubbles coming up when they dive? Like, or because it almost looked like the water was it still flat. it was still moving or differently. So but. yeah, that's a lot of weight um, and a lot of volume to surface and then dive down. So what we call it the whale footprint. When this whale goes up and down, it actually acts water displacement, sucks that down, and leaves a footprint. Yeah. And also any air that. Nick went on to explain tons of different facts about the humpback whales, and on the way back, we ran into a few stray boxes. All right. So of course, we picked them up. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. There's always something going on, but nothing huge in this area. Yeah. Fishing is definitely still up. There's always the conflict between charter fishing and commercial fishing, especially with the halibut population, and that's been highly regulated where now the fish that come in are a lot smaller than they used to be. That even happens with the salmon. This this year's salmon derby, the winner was about 14 pounds. And I think the year that I started, the winner was 20 pounds. And the salmon have progressively just gotten smaller and smaller over the years. It could be overfishing, it could be um, water temperatures. The Sea Life Center does a lot of monitoring that, especially with sea lion population and whatnot. Since Alaska relies so much on the fishing industry, they watch it pretty closely to make sure. If you're trying to catch salmon, by the day they'll, have, they'll be counting the fish that make it up the stream, and then they'll adjust the limits of what you can catch based on how many fish have Hmm. Gone out. Oh, yeah. That's interesting. Alright. Not all heroes wear capes. Hey, one piece at a time. <laughs> <laughs> it was time for a cup of coffee at Resurrect Art Coffee House. A funky hangout with craft coffee and an art gallery set inside an old church didn't take long for me to take my warm cup of coffee down to the water. You don't really need to do much in Seward with views like this and eagles flying overhead. All you have to do is just walk down here. I could stand here and watch the boats go by and the sea life for hours. There's even places to camp right next to the water with views like this and still be in walking distance from everything else in town. we decided to go for another hike, this time to the south of Seward, where we found a river mouth that's a popular spot for seabirds. The seabirds gather here in the interest of one thing, salmon. This time of year, at the end of summer, you'll find silver salmon swimming upstream to lay their eggs. Life begins and ends for salmon and these rivers. Young salmon hide from predators and estuaries, fatten up and slowly adjust to salt water before heading out to sea. Around a year and a half later, after a life of adventure in the open water, they'll return to lay their eggs, then just stop eating. When they stop eating, hormonal changes will start to take place and they will rest in peace. The life of a salmon. The charm of Seward left a lasting impression on me and I already can't wait to return one day. But for now, it's time to make our way back north and see what we'll find along the way. Under a starry sky You are my one solution To the mystery of why 
Let's pack a bag and migrate To anywhere we please Clamber up the mountains underneath the sea Just you and me Welcome to Girdwood, a small town just outside Anchorage, well equipped for hiking, mountain biking, skiing, snowboarding, and Alaska Resort. This four-star hotel is where we'll be spending the next two nights and offers all the comforts of home and more while still enjoying the Alaskan wilderness. It's nestled in a lush valley surrounded by mountain peaks, hanging glaciers, and spectacular ocean views of Turnigan Arm. As we walked inside the resort, we noticed the perfect modern touches with rich native influences done by local Alaskan artists. And it really brought the natural beauty of Alaska's great outdoors inside. In the room, we were greeted with views of Alaska Mountain and made ourselves at home. This resort has everything you could possibly need, from shopping to a cafe in the morning and a subway-style station that leads to an aerial tram. This tram climbs 2,300 feet from the hotel to the top of the mountain, where you'll find fine dining and priceless panoramic views. Instead of taking the tram, we decided to hike up the North Face instead. We slowly made our way up, being the Floridians that we are, and were then rewarded with amazing perspectives of the Chugach Mountains and Turnigan Arm. Right about here is where I started regretting how much equipment I brought with me and a jacket that I didn't even need. Nothing warms the soul quite like a great meal after a hike, and the Pond Cafe at Alaska Resort delivered just that for dinner. Kristen had king crab legs, and pretty much any chance I had while on this trip, I was ordering fresh salmon. We then managed to find the quintessential Alaskan fireplace, like a scene from a vintage postcard on your grandmother's refrigerator, where we enjoyed an Alaska brewski from Girdwood Brewing. Twin brothers Brett and Rory took their love for backcountry adventure, engineering, and a damn good beer to open Girdwood Brewing, along with beer ambassador Josh. After a taste of everything they had going on there and seeing the many creations they've come up with over the years, I was eager to hear more about their story. So I sat down with Rory for a pint but then didn't really see the feasibility in, in starting my own ski company. When I was 18 and graduating high school, how are you supposed to know what you want to do for the rest of your life, right? You were already thinking about having your own company when you were 18. Yeah, I guess, apparently. <laughs> yeah, so there you go. You manifested it. <laughs> work, work for myself, yeah. And I've been in Alaska since 2005, so just over, or going on, yeah, just over 16, 16 years, years now. Yeah. Yeah. So you've seen some changes take place. And oh yeah, the brewery scene was, was a skeleton of what it is today. There was, you know, maybe 10 or 15 breweries then. Um, now I just saw some Someone published that they were like about to visit their 48th brewery in, in Alaska. So, so there's yeah, there's a lot more now. Girdwood Brewing has been here just over four years. Like I said, March of 2017. So, is there anything ingredient-wise in the beer that is local, or is, is a lot of it have to be imported? Or? Yeah, for the most part, all of our all of our ingredients come from the Pacific Northwest. There are a few places up here that um, that have some like raw wheat and stuff like that you could use, but but for the most part, importing stuff. Even though logistically it's challenging to get stuff shipped on a barge up here. Are there any conflicts you you deal with with the brewing beer here in the 
hop and malt industry, it's an agriculture product. So any anytime there's you know forest fires or any sort of you know crazy weather, you're you're definitely influencing what next year's product is going to be like. So there's definitely challenges like that. You know, it's from that perspective, it's kind of like the culinary industry where you know you each uh, harvest there's only a finite amount. So trying to schedule and then plan for growth at that same time. So okay, this time next year, how much of that are we going to be using? Like, yeah. Is there a plan to have like more than one location or you want to? No, that's Alaska law. You can only sell the beer that you brew in the facility that you brew it in. Okay. So, so if we do a collaboration with a brewery in Fairbanks or Anchorage, we can't serve that beer here. We can only serve it at their brewery. All of our growth just continues to be selling out of the tap room. We got a canning line. We haven't even branched out to any, uh, any distributors or anything. We're selling all those cans off-site right out, of the, right out of the fridge here so yeah it's so cool. which uh, you can self-distribute as much as you want in alaska so that's convenient alyeska resort you said you had their alyeska brewski mm -hmm. hazy pale ale i think it's their top selling beer i literally took a sip and i was like i want to ship this home yeah it almost was like this cross between an ipa and a white ale that's that's a good description um it's not super bitter, but it's got like it's got like tropical juicy hops. Yeah. Um, but then it, there's a heavy like wheat and oat component. Well, cool, man. Yeah, it's been yeah. really interesting learning about all this. Yeah. So I really appreciate your time and. I can talk uh, for hours. So. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, cheers to your success. Yeah, thanks, man. Doing something that you love. Yeah, for sure. The brewery scene in Alaska is popping off, and it's great to see Rory, Brett, and their whole crew doing something they enjoy and contributing to the community. And now back to you. Alaskan wilderness because just down the road is this nice quiet hike to a waterfall. Back at the resort, as we enjoyed another decadent meal, I was thinking we've been eating a lot of seafood this trip, but we still haven't been fishing. Fishing is one of the things Alaska is known for, so we had to find a way. Hope Fishing Charters answered our cry for help, and that's when we met Barbara and Mel, and set out on an authentic Alaskan salmon fishing experience on the 20 Mile River. Try not to Reel up any slack until it gets a lot closer. Make sure the hook sticks out the other side. Yeah. <laughs> that way it actually hooks into the fish. That was a really good cast. Thank you. <laughs> uh, had some not good casts, so I figure. <laughs> Gotta get one, right? Here's one. That's a good riff right there. Yeah. You got a good fish, one. Oh. Might be. It's a good one? Yep. All right. You're going by the color? Yeah, going by yeah. the color. Uh, what's the uh, your favorite taste for salmon, though? What kind of salmon do you like? Silver. Silver? Even though a lot of people will say reds, the reds are really good, too. Yeah. So red and silver are most desirable? Yeah. Okay. You lay your bobber in, go up on the bow. Okay. Cast it farther up. Alrighty. Oh, tight. There it is. Real, real. Pull it up, pull it up. Yank, Yank it up. Yay, we got the one. Good job. Good. Probably the freshest one yet. Really? <laughs> yep. <laughs> and if you see one that still has its sea lice clinging to it, that's really fresh. Oh, okay. Um, sea lice cleans the fish. The sea lice uh, clean their sea scales when they're out in the ocean. Ah. <laughs> Does it have teeth? Oh, here. Yeah, she has teeth. That's why you want to keep your fingers here, away from the, the I don't mouth. know if I want to hold okay, it. Okay, well here, we'll yeah, just... Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the beautiful fish, there we go. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> Yay. Very good job. You're going to be tasty. You got the big one. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> View is pretty distracting from fishing. <laughs> 
three salmon each. But only two can be served. That's when they're still flopping around. Yeah. That's good. You get to keep the you keep the eggs for bait. Yeah, we'll be using these next year for bait. Oh wow, you're gonna freeze it? We'll put some dye in the bag, let them sit in the refrigerator for a couple of days. Then he'll put them outside on a piece of plywood with a whole bunch of salt and uh, toughen up the tissues. That way it actually stays on the hook. Oh. Because that stuff is it's so soft and everything. Yeah, it would just disintegrate. How many pounds do you think this is? No, that's, well, no, what did you say, 10 pounds? Eight to 10. Our time on the river with Barbara and Mel was very special. It was one of the highlights of our trip, and we ended up with four silver salmon. I was just thinking the whole time I was sitting there with Mel, this guy has been living this lifestyle his entire life. This is his backyard. Just think how many experiences he's had out here in the last frontier. Between fishing ever since he could walk and gold digging, it was such a privilege to be able to go fishing with both him and Barbara. I think a lot of people have never fished too. Really? It yeah. can be a pain in the butt. Yeah. <laughs> All that was left to do now was find a place to send our fish 3,000 miles away. And Indian Valley Meats specializes in just that. They're a family-owned business that's been processing Alaska's wild game animals since 1976. And today, they'll be helping us send our salmon all the way back to Florida. Time to take the Seward Highway back toward Anchorage, where we'll be spending another night and one more day in Alaska. But first things first, pizza from Moose's Tooth Pub and Pizzeria. They host inventive pizzas and house-brewed beer served in a bustling, colorful hangout with psychedelic art and made for a great stop on our way back to the city. Then just like that, we were back in Anchorage where it all started. And we're excited to check out a couple of special places we didn't make it to the first time around. Our lodging for the night will be here at the historic Anchorage Hotel. In its infancy, many people came to Anchorage not only by boat, but by dog team. And the basement of the hotel was converted into a kennel that housed up to 100 dogs per night. Later found in the basement was a coal room that provided heat for the entire city block. So the hotel played a significant role in the modernization of the city. Exploring the history of this place is an experience in itself, and all of the hallways are lined with old photos. After checking into the hotel, we stop by the Umingmak Cooperative. This cooperative is owned by 250 Native Alaskan women from remote coastal villages who knit each item by hand. They're knitting with kivyut, a wool from an arctic musk ox that just so happens to be softer than alpaca fiber and eight times warmer than wool. Each village has signature patterns they are using derived from traditional aspects of village life and the Eskimo culture. When in Anchorage, stop by this little brown house to see and feel their one-of-a-kind local product. Just down the block from there, I had one of the best margaritas I've ever tasted at Simon and Seaford's Saloon and Grill. Accompanied by an equally memorable meal, sunset, and dessert. On my last day in Alaska, I visited the Ulu factory. What's an Ulu? To put it simply, it's a knife. But you won't find this knife in your current kitchen. Of all the innovative tools that came from the indigenous people, this one is paramount. The Ulu knife was their main cutting tool, dating back thousands of years. It was originally made from flat, thin rocks, slate, or even jade. I met Melinda, who's been working here for over a decade, and she generously offered me a slice of her experience. The Ulu was a tool that was passed down through the generations it was actually believed to carry with it the, the family's story, the family history. The product itself, because it is such a functional item 
and historically significant, I mean, it sells itself. And it amazes me every day how many people have never heard of it before. Yeah. And the mission was to provide uh, an affordable American-made product that anybody could have in their kitchen, as well as educate folks on why it's such an important tool in our history. Keep the history alive. Keep the history alive, yeah, yeah. I mean, and American manufacturing has kind of been going by the wayside. And so the fact that we're kind of doing two things at the same time with American manufacturing and historical significance. I think it's pretty awesome. The word ulu in the in the native tongue means woman's knife or woman's tool. So I'm pretty convinced a woman invented it. Makes sense to me. <laughs> I don't know that for a fact, but I'm pretty convinced. If you catch this place open on a weekday, you'll likely have a chance to see the factory in motion. Everything that happens in the lower 48 usually happens in Alaska last. And our road trip from Anchorage down to Seward felt like going back in time. Normally, after a trip like this, I'm ready to go home, but this place was different. Alaska just feels so unexplored and undeveloped. It was a relief to find such a place in the chaotic world today. We saw so much during our 10-day adventure but it was just a small fraction of this state. I'm already dreaming of taking the train to Denali National Park, living off the grid for a few days in the winter time, and exploring the islands around Juneau. But for now, it's time to head to the airport, fly home, and share our stories with friends and family. I hope you enjoyed my film. Thanks for watching. Until next time. <laughs>